Hello wild ones. Here we are again, masked and trying to keep the native plant campaign going. So, uh, welcome. Welcome to our new name, our new members and welcome to our loyal members. Um, it sure is uh, good. It was good to see faces at the plant sale. Um, good to connect with some people. But we are going to uh, not, probably not do August meeting uh, in person. Obviously, we're not doing our July meeting. The good news is that our July speaker, Wayne Pauley, who is going to share stories about native plants and it's a very interactive program, he agreed that he would just postpone his until next year when we all can be meeting together so that we have that dialogue. So instead we have um, Ben and Marion French's yard. Ben French is um, the propagator at Johnson's and responsible for the beautiful plants during the native plant sale that, that we've been purchasing, along with a few other plants, I'm sure. Um, so we're gonna tour their, their yard, uh, which is a, a great suburban, or urban yard, I should say. And as you can see, we've got a little treat here, lots and lots of native plants. So a couple of things I just wanted to mention. Um, plant sale update. This had to be one of our most, if not the most, successful year. We uh, picked up a lot of extra, a lot of new members. We also um, brought in a much larger contribution from Johnson's Nursery, which is wonderful. Thank you, Johnson's. Um, we will get a contribution of over a thousand dollars, which is huge. So it's the biggest contribution I've ever seen uh, since my membership with Wild Ones. So thank you all for supporting the cause for putting your money where your mouth is and getting native plants out into the landscapes. Um, for August, we are going to do, we're planning to do Carolyn Larkin's yard tour. That was our original plan. And she's also agreed to do it virtually. Um, Cause I, I mean, unless there's a big miracle between now and August, we will be doing that as a, uh, um, a, a recorded program as well. So I hope you enjoy these. Uh, one of our members said, hey, these will be great in the middle of February when there's nothing green, nothing blooming, to be able to pull up these videos and just revisit uh, these beautiful spots that we're touring. Um, all right, I did one announcement, quick announcement. Uh, one of our members, Gary Britton, told me about a new invasive, and it's called Deptford Pink. It's like 25 inches tall. It's got real thin leaves. Uh, thin leaves, thin stem, uh, not much of a showy flower. So Stepford Pink, if you find something new in your yard that's pink, look it up and see what it is. Um, so we don't you know, let that go wild like the other invasives that have gone wild. Uh, let's see here. Also, um, did anyone catch Doug Tallamy? Free webinar he did. If you didn't, you should look it up. It was fantastic. The man is so, so passionate about saving pollinators, insects, caterpillars, and of course the way to save them is to plant native plants. I mean his message was very clear. It's not an option, it's something we must do in order to save bees and pollinators and keep food crops and other animals and up, on up the food, food chain. So mandatory, not optional. We need to get native plants back into our, our communities and into wherever we can, <laughs> wherever we can is really the, the big key here. Get rid of the grass and get some native plants planted. He also has a book out, I've not read it yet, but I've heard it's fantastic. Um, he's got his original book um, and then Nature's Best Hope is his newest book, came out earlier this year. So look him up, he's on Facebook, he's on YouTube, and he, we also had, I sent a link out for that webinar. He generously shared um, the program to whoever wants to tune in. So I hope you'll catch it, it's really great. Um, I wanted to mention Wild Ones National actually sponsored his program. I didn't realize that at first. And uh, you know, what a great, great thing for them to do for their members. Um, they are also gonna sponsor another program, a webinar with Heather Holm. She is the bee lady. She wrote this book, this was I think her last book. It's all native plants and bees. And she will be the speaker for another free webinar. And that is on September 24th, 7.30 to 9 o'clock. You will need to register like you did for the Doug Tallamy talk um, through event, uh, Eventbrite. And I can certainly send the link to it. I've already registered. I would suggest registering 
as soon as you can. For some reason, Doug Tallamy's uh, program, they had a max number of uh, attendees, which is weird because it's a webinar, but perhaps that's what the licensing was or something like that. And I want to thank John Michael, who is our camera and audio man here. Thank you again for spending time to record another program for us. So, Marion, thank you so much for sharing your yard with us. Please thank Ben for sharing it as well as propagating our native plants. And we'll let Marion start the tour. All right, well, thanks for stopping by, everybody. Uh, we were really excited to have a virtual tour. So, <laughs> I think the idea of watching it in February is a fantastic idea because, mm -hmm. yeah, it gets long, <laughs> as yeah. we all know. Um, but yeah, so uh, Ben and I bought this property about seven years ago uh, when we, um, uh, when it was basically a blank slate. There was nothing but lawn, this entire, if you can imagine, this whole area. And uh, when we go in the back, you'll see that was all lawn also. So basically being two plant people, I'm a horticulturist as well. Uh, we just uh, took it as a challenge, basically. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> With our, our love of native plants, which has just only grown every year since we've started. Pun um, intended, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've learned a lot of things setting this up, um, but every year the, the prairie expands a little bit further into the front. So it's a work in progress like anybody's garden, but I think we're... What, what's spot. something a good thing you learned and uh, not so good thing you learned oh, maybe boy. when you were looking out here? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I know uh, height is always a big concern with a lot of plants and I myself have a type B cottage garden kind of aesthetic that I enjoy but uh, my husband kind of balances me out um, so he's more <laughs> of a, you know, things should be a certain height and they should not fall over on you when you walk past and those are very good things um, especially with native plants because a lot of people if they don't know anything about them that's kind of the misconception is that they're all big and crazy and they're gonna fall over and be ugly and look weedy and so that was of course being in the front yard a big challenge for us but um, you can kind of see like we've got different heights and I think that's important um, but uh, the common milkweed is probably one of my biggest challenges, but also a reward for us. Um, obviously, monarchs, everybody everybody that's watching this should know <laughs> that monarchs are well, important. Hopefully we've got some new people. And hopefully they're yep. learning because yes. it's, a, it's quite an adventure to grow milkweed. And we have a few species of milkweed on the property now. Uh, because you, if you come out here in the afternoon, you can just see... The monarch circling it's it's really cool i saw one when i came up oh yeah <laughs> yeah but the the thing with um like common milkweed is probably one of the more aggressive plants so the way you see it now is not how it would grow if i left it alone so that's why i call this the prairie garden not just a prairie because we end up it's pretty easy how to do it um, but you pretty much just can grab the suckers even when they're kind of this size and either you can just snap them off at the base or sometimes I just cut them or you pull up a little bit and it's kind of just a maintenance thing so every so often if they pop up in a weird spot I'll just pull a few and then um, and try to make sure there's no caterpillars on it either which is kind of the trick but uh, we have a compost pile in the back so I figure if I if I put them there then they'll find a way and they'll definitely find food either way so not too bad just kind of moving them slightly like when this time of year or any time of year do you it's, do it, your kind of thinning out it kind of it ends up a lot in the spring mm -hmm. when they all start popping up but then um kind of just throughout like actually uh, this past week uh we ended up pulling out a few just to kind of thin it out a little bit mm -hmm. Um, and then it helps uh, for the health of the plant also. It's, uh, the first year I planted the common milkweed, I had a huge pile of it right here. And it was just, I think it was too much of a monoculture, which a lot of native plants aren't used to growing that way because usually it's a native community made of all kinds of different species. So they actually got uh, tons of aphids and they got... Um, all this mildew and, and, and weird stuff was going on. But now that we've got them um, kind of integrated into the whole garden, they seem to do really well. 
It looks great. It looks controlled and <laughs> actually as we were talking about things that tip and fold over, mm -hmm. those are great supports. Yeah. You know, and they're, they're upright, they're strong. Yeah, and it's true. And um, yeah, the, the height thing is, is always hard too, just to pick things that stay short-ish. And then the tall things I put in the middle, mm -hmm. like you said, is support. So yeah, yeah. like that's probably the tallest bed by far because I had to have a sylphium. This is uh, a, <laughs> sylphiums are just my spirit plant, <laughs> if you can believe it. We'll share with the, the group what yeah, so, now. Yeah, so a sylphium, um, yeah, I, I saw a hummingbird uh, visiting one of the flowers earlier and I have never <laughs> seen that before, so that was amazing. It didn't stay long, so maybe it didn't find what it liked, but it's loaded with bees all the time. Uh, this is a weird one, though. <laughs> Urban. <laughs> that, that is one of the joys of urban gardens. Uh, but so this is a cross between a compass plant and a prairie dock. So you can kind of see the leaves are a little different. They're not, you know, like a prairie dock would have kind of a whole leaf with uh, the margins would, would not be toothed at all. And a compass plant would have kind of a different shape to it and the form would be a little different too. So this guy is kind of in the middle. Hmm, I just I, I just love to it. I figure out what the leaves were. It's a little it's a little strange. Yeah, it's not it's not a normal sylphium, but not your average sylphium for not your average yard. Big patch of the native uh cactus, right? Yes. Yes, this is the, the native Apuncha, mm -hmm. the Apuncha humufusa, <laughs> and unfortunately we definitely missed the flowers, but the fruits are kind of decorative when they, they start mm -hmm. to turn pink after a little while. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something that I would, I would say a lot of people could grow if you've got the good drainage, and you see we're kind of on a hill here, and uh, before we planted it we also kind of added um, a lot of sand and coarse gravel to the spot. So it's kind of in its own little little bed. It's definitely happy. And don't plant it anywhere where there's lots of weeds. <laughs> because <laughs> you will not do yourself any favors later, as you can see. I will try to bravely... There we go. We'll get that out of there. Yeah, so because we were on the hill, we also wanted to try out um, other things that like drainage. Like you see the Ruelia here, the, the wild petunia. And that likes a lot of drainage and dry areas. And we've got a few of the native lupines also, but they're not really noticeable now. They do bloom in the spring. Oh, there, that guy's got some seeds. Their seed pods are kind of fun, how they split like that little spiral. That is cool. Kind of different. Yeah, that's really different. I've I had, have not have had any luck growing lupines. Yeah, they're, yeah, we were really surprised that they actually grew here for us because it was kind of a gamble, like, you know, just to see what happens, like a lot of this, I suppose. Yep. And we have the native flamingo there. <laughs> <laughs> I believe they're native to us, Alice. <laughs> and the native flamingos having other native flamingos, as we'll see. Yes, yes, they're, sometimes they're found in this yard. But the, the prairie drop seed grass is definitely my go-to mm. for, for filling in and supporting the other plants. And uh, the biggest, it's really, it's really been helping uh, fight the bindweed problem that we have in this yard. And once I cleared the sod, I realized how much bindweed was oh. in the yard. And for those of you that are not familiar with bindweed, I envy you because <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like a tiny morning glory. And if you look really closely, like I can see it standing here, but that's because I, you know, I'm always in it. Uh, but they get little little flowers, and you would think it was pretty if it wasn't trying to smother all of your plants. So that's been the biggest challenge by far, is just keeping that under control. But as this has filled in so much, it has decreased nice. dramatically. What's that kind of shrubby plant in the back with the smaller yellow flowers? Oh, yes, yeah, that is the that is the St. John's wort. Oh. And I think that's, yeah, that's that's a native for sure, yep, but it is. it's not one that you see, you know, if you go to visit places, I, at least I haven't seen it in the wild as mm -hmm. much, but, oh, it's really oh, and there's little bees on it, that's perfect, yes. Excellent. You know, and that's something, 
Uh, like you mentioned, Doug Tallamy and mm -hmm. the importance of, of native plants for insects. I have never seen so many different kinds of bees than when we started planting all of this stuff. And that now, now that you know we're going on year seven, it's just amazing what different colors and sizes and all the different native bees that we have. It's, um, it's so cool. Agreed. So, where would you like to go? All oh, right. we've got some nodding onion here. Oh, too. yeah, there's that the nodding cool. onion. Yeah. And the nodding onion is, is wonderful in the spring. Actually, I love it because it, you know, it's gonna flower now, but the green part comes up and is lush when a lot of the grasses are not really doing their thing yet. So I've been trying to, we've been trying to put more of that in here just because it's, that's the only thing with the prairie is that like, you know, a lot of it is warm season plants. So like for a few months, it's, it's kind of stalling out because it's just not warm and, and it's not growing, but. March and April are not fun. So. Right. <laughs> but that's why we have the woodland garden, right? Exactly. But. Love the blood root. <laughs> yeah. So it's all the, all so the this is great. All the way down the side of the driveway and the house, you've incorporated native plants. Yeah, it's In kind places of... places where a lot of people, you know, it's a small area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had to mow that when we, when we moved in. <laughs> we're like, it was grass there? Yeah, there was just a, just a little tiny strip of grass and... That went pretty well, fast. this is much more productive. That's for sure. That's for sure. Oh, and um, we can't. We, yeah, we can't not talk about the world milkweed. That's oh, that's really becoming one of my favorites. I have a lot of favorites. You, you will find. But uh, it's it's it spreads, but not as aggressively as its older brother, the the common milkweed. But um, it's just the texture is wonderful. And I, I guess it's up there as one of the preferred milkweeds mm -hmm. for the caterpillars. It's so. amazing, you know, the leaves are so small and thin. Mm -hmm. It's hard to... Like, how would they eat that? Yeah, or how could <laughs> it serve, you know, how, is it enough? Or, yeah. yeah. They manage, though. Oh, yeah, they, they'll find a way. Yeah. If you plant it, they will come. It's it's really true. Yeah, it's really it is, true. totally. You can see the seed pods, the remnants of our shooting stars. We've got quite a few shooting stars in the spring. And that's that's what gets me through in the spring, really, in the front yard. They're one of my favorite wildflowers. Mm -hmm. Again, lots of favorites. But. <laughs> I have a nice oak tree in the front yes, here. Yes, bur, the bur oak. That bur is oak. one of my favorite trees. <laughs> yep. yep I, uh, I grew up uh, in Kenosha. Oh, you and, did. and down that way, there's oh, they just they grow such great oaks. <laughs> Up here, they do too. Uh huh. But it's just I remember um, in my childhood, there's just a lot of places where they just have the big ancient oak trees, and oh, I just gotta Kenosha. hug everyone. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And your butterfly weed looks wonderful. Oh there. yeah, that's a great pop of color that provides. That orange is just incredible. Isn't it? It's just it's amazing. Yep. And then, so this was like the oldest section of the prairie over mm -hmm. here. And then kind of as you go east here is kind of a newer section, newer and newer. We just missed the lead plant, unfortunately. But that's a, a really nice, it's almost like a shrub. It's like one of those plants that is kind of woody. So when you're cutting everything else back, you just have to watch out and remember where you put the lead plant. Because it, uh... It, it likes to get back in the winter. It dies back a little bit, but, but it still maintains. Some it's structure. got yeah, it's got a little bit of a of a stem. Let's see if I can find it. This one's not super old yet, but some of this will sprout back next year. Oh yeah, here you can see. You can kind of see where the cut was uh, over the like in the spring cleanup time, mm -hmm. and then it, and then it's okay. branched up. So I mean, you don't have to, but it it gets you know it get a good size. And then uh, we went Leatris crazy this year, so <laughs> this little section is new and we've got all kinds of Leatris nice. popping here. A couple baby Baptisias, uh, false indigos in there. Now, do you prune that at all? Because, I mean, that can get really... You know, it's weird. The Baptisia, like, does not care if you cut it all the way to the ground. Uh-huh. So, it, but the cool thing, you can see the big guy in the back yeah. there. And I have to confess, that's the Australis, that's the blue one, so that's, the blue Baptisia is technically not native, 
from what I've been told. But uh, all of them get the seed pods, and if you let them stay up all winter, and they will, they have very strong stems, it kind of will like rattle in the wind, and it, it's kind of a, a, a unique texture element. I mean, really, this whole garden holds up pretty well in the snow, and uh, you get all the all the textures and all the stems and the snow, and it's it's really nice. It kind of reminds you of what what you have year round. Yeah, no reason to cut the stems. Right. It does add interest. I found that on a swamp milkweed I have in my yard, there were yellow finches and purple finches like peeling off this, oh. the fibers from the stems from last year. Oh. And I still have them yeah. standing up. I thought, well, I'm not going to cut these at all. Oh, if not they're enough. using it, yeah. yeah. And yeah. My Orioles did that this year. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Nice. They'd oh, start great. at the top of the, of the uh, red milkweed stem and then like shimmy down <laughs> and strip and it off. And I saw a pecking order there. So the male yellow finch would start the, you know, pull up a fiber. Yeah. Female would come along. She'd be the one that actually ripped it down and carried it away. He'd start another one. She'd come and grab it. That is <laughs> Talk awesome. about a partnership, right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. Oh. Cool to watch. Yeah, the, the goldfinches like to, they start to circle this time of year. You know, I think they test all the all the flowers just to see uh, if they're ready or not. They're just in here all, all the whole fall. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> just clouds of them. I want to talk about this plant. That's a uh, rather unusual name. Oh, the, the dotted horse mint. Mm -hmm. That's what that's called. And I, I don't know how close you can see, but the flowers are actually these guys. Oh. And they're dotted. So that's where the dot ah, comes from. That, that's it's not, interesting. It's not very apparent from far away. But yeah, most of it, most of the color is the bracts, mm -hmm. which is the, the leaves that are around the flower. But that... That is a really fun plant. It's it, it blooms right now. It kind of like it's kind of bridging the gap between a lot of things. Sure, that looks great. So yeah, we've got. Let's see, we even have some thimbleberry. Thimbleberry or thimbleweed? Uh, thimble, thimble flower. Thimble flower. Th thimble something. Yeah, right? th exactly. I can never <laughs> keep like them thimbles. straight. Yeah, I call yeah. it the Q-tip plant. Yeah. Know, for the, <laughs> The, the uh, cottony seed head that they did get. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, that was, and that's a nice one too for bridging the gap. Uh, that blooms when pretty much nothing else is going on and when the pale purple coneflower is thinking about blooming. So <laughs> they're not super showy, but they are a flower when there isn't one. So that's kind of nice. So we, you know, we're, we're trying to do the year-round flowers for all the pollinators that come through and all the different, all the different ones. So these are the asters in waiting, all these little ones here. What type of aster is that? I believe it's Aster Lavis, the, the smooth blue aster. Oh. I think I've got a couple in here. Okay. And I always forget. Nice. Yeah. I, I really wish I could do a New England aster, but... They just they, they talk about size. Those get a little too big for our little space here. So right. I haven't found a way to <laughs> get one of those in here yet. But yeah, I can really notice the asters this time of year because they're really getting ready. Mm -hmm. And now the shrub out here. Oh, and that. We didn't really talk about that. Oh, no, we didn't yet. That is actually uh, the native crab apple. So that's a prairie crab It apple. is. I have one that I planted two oh. years ago. I'm glad to see it. Excellent. It's, yeah, I planted it by a dwarf bush honeysuckle, which is really taking up way too much space. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that was one of my, uh, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Live and learn, right? Live and learn. Yeah, I'll just cut back the honeysuckle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so in the spring, the, the prairie crab apple gets the, it's like the most delicate pink flowers. It's so beautiful. And uh, then it just gets a really hard green apples that uh, allegedly you can't eat, but I think something must eat them. Mm -hmm. And then in the background, you, I don't know, you could see the, the cup plant. That was one of our first plantings also. Uh, that was kind of a weird story. Uh, when we had our apartment, Ben and I, um, he brought it home from work because when you, when you grow plants for a living, Sometimes you bring plants home because of reasons, you know, one reason or another. And uh, we kept it in a pot outside of our uh, 
apartment for a few years and I promised it. I was like, well, if you've lived this long, when we get a place, you will get in the ground. I promise. <laughs> and uh, we got here and then I realized it was a huge plant and I didn't know where to put it, but uh, it's, it does pretty well over here. Boy, it works. <laughs> it works. The combination looks great too. And the iron weed yep. is the purple. And that's just starting. I love, I just love that purple. It's beautiful. Yeah, this works. You know, what is this? Maybe a five by five, six by six area. Mm -hmm. You've got cup plant and lead plant. It that's works great. It, it's a good combo for the late summer. Mm -hmm. They always say that birds are supposed to drink out of the cups. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you, have you guys ever seen that? I haven't <laughs> seen birds, but I've seen insects. I have, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. I have seen uh, cute little moths drinking. Mm -hmm. So, but I have a couple of bird baths too that oh, the yeah. birds in my yard use regularly. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Oh, you can see the passing oh, apples and then there's already. Oh, the, there's the fruits. Yeah, yeah. And they kind of get yellow in the fall, so they're kind of they're kind of like a decorative fruit. Uh huh. And you said some animals do eat them. I think I think something must eat them because mm -hmm. they do disappear eventually. Okay. <laughs> And I don't rake them all up, so. <laughs> oh, look at you, you have a little patch of swamp milk oh, down and then, there. Yeah. <laughs> and some more liatris. Beautiful, yep. you've just packed so much stuff in here, it's great. Yeah, and it's it's funny because when we began this garden, when there, you know, the first couple plants, I we had gone to a talk at one of the Wild Ones conferences. Nice. Uh, yeah, oh, love the conferences. Mm -hmm. um, and there was, a, the speaker had all these great points about how to, um, how to plan the right kind of front yard garden with natives to make it um, orderly. And mm -hmm. I remember she said something about picking picking five species and sticking with that and using that as your palette and then it will look like an organized, you know. So we kind of started doing that and as you can see, we uh, <laughs> just uh, got tempted by too many plants and yeah, you're um, making it worse. It's beautiful. But well, thank you. It's so beautiful. <laughs> yep. I mean, I like it. <laughs> but that's what matters. And, and it, so do a lot of pollinators and birds and yeah. Hopefully, a lot of people that pass by too. You know, maybe. Mm -hmm. I always really hope that you know we get somebody else interested, and that right. would just make that would make it all worth it, really. So here are the. Sh the bean pods on Baptisia, one that's starting to dry out more out of all of them. There's you know, a couple and I, of them. I think it normally is covered, and it did not bloom very well this year for us. Ah. I don't know if there was a late frost that nipped it or what happened, but I was kind of bummed out because normally they're, it, they're, just, they're just not so nice. So. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it still looks healthy. Yeah. The foliage itself is a great yeah, accent. It is so. beautiful. My, uh, like a tiny rain garden that I started <laughs> here uh, because we get a lot. I mean, the downspout. Oh, there's a hummingbird. Oh no. Oh. Yeah. She's like, I don't know where to go. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing in my garden? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Who are you people? Right, right. Uh, just be, uh, because we've got the gutter right there and it always just spills right down this hill. So this is the first attempt. Uh, to slow it down, and then we've got, well, I'm sure it's slowed down by all the root systems mm -hmm. we've got going on here also. But, but again, Angelica. such a small area. What is this again? Angelica. Angelica. Mm-hmm. I've got some more liatris, prairie drop seeds, swamp milk So weed. is is Angelica, I'm not familiar with it at all. Well, it's, a, it's in a lot of wetlands, mm -hmm. kind of wet areas, and it, it's related to carrots. Oh. So it's in the, yeah, it's in the carrot family, and uh, it's not blooming yet, but when it does bloom, it keeps getting taller, and then it's like a little globe, almost, of flowers. Oh. And uh, bees just go crazy for it. It's a really good pollinator plant. Great. And it's a native plant? Yep. Okay. Well, you learn something new every day, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> there's so many, there's so many plants. <laughs> yeah, yep. So many plants, so little time. Yeah. So we've got... Uh, you know, it's funny, the daisy flea bane kind of found its way mm -hmm. in here on its own, and I know that sometimes that's kind of a weed. It's like a weedy native. 
but it, I it grows in it. more disturbed places so it's yeah. but it's hardy as as heck and mm -hmm. i i don't mind them in my yard um yeah i kind of like it it's kind of it adds a little something yeah and if you don't <laughs> like it you, it's easy to pull so right yeah this is a, a golden rod experiment that i started and kind of wished i hadn't wow. <laughs> so you want to talk about learning um I'm not even sure if, which species exactly it is, mm -hmm. uh, but I saw a goldenrod that was beautiful uh, near where I work, and someone took seeds and started some, and it didn't seem uh, like it was going to go crazy where it was, but boy, it likes my yard because it's, <laughs> you, you can see, it, it's, a, it's a little aggressive, so... <laughs> I've kind of just been yeah. cutting it back when it gets in my way and trying Fills to... the spot well. I, I think it looks really neat. It does, and it's it's not blooming yet, but the mm -hmm. flowers are just gorgeous, so... Yep. And, and in the, the corner, of course. Yeah, we've got the, the Joe Pie weed, which actually seeded itself from the neighbors. They've got a Joe Pie weed over there, so... Yay, neighbors! I thought, well, hey, free Joe Pie weed. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> kidding. Nothing to complain about. Looks good. And I've got kind of a, it's kind of like a pollinator insect border, and then the the vegetable garden. Oh wow, whole other world. So here. yeah, it's we've got different zones mm -hmm. kind of going on in our yard. So we've got like the, the prairie garden, and then where you know like where we entertain, we've got the vegetables, and then as you go further back, then it it becomes like the woodland. Well, let's move on so, and check yeah, some of that uh, out. Looks very cool. So now we're entering the realm where some non-natives may be found. <laughs> <laughs> warning, warning. Yes, warning. Avert your eyes. <laughs> Good boy, Freddy. Freddy, you stay here. Oh, we might want to look at this. Uh, oh, no, no, here. no, no, Freddy. He just loves visitors. <laughs> Hi, Freddy. Hello there. He doesn't really help me garden, but come over and take cute. a look at that? That is a, one oh, of my the, favorite sedges. Oh, they're so cool. Isn't it great? Yeah. And I have an astray, a, a metal one Freddy. that I'm going to. It's a, it's not Freddy. It's good. <laughs> that I'm going. It, it reminds me of the sedge. I'm gonna hang it near where I have one that's in full bloom. Oh uh, yeah. Hello, Freddy. Hello. Freddy. Yep, it's okay. I like dogs. No oh, worries. Good, good. No worries. I have one at home. <laughs> All right, yeah, so I guess here is mostly, we try to plant just good flowers for pollinators. And, you know, the more, the more flowers you have, the, the, better, the better vegetables you'll grow also. Uh, the better, you know, the more flowers that are around things like tomatoes and everything, just bring in oh, all yeah, the pollinators. That, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. That's what they do. They, po they pollinate. Yeah. Oh, and um, and then also a lot of a lot of different types of flowers bring in um, like predatory insects that'll help keep your pest numbers down. Um, a lot of you know just, just different types of flowers bring different folks in to the garden, so it's always good. Yep. Works out for everybody. Absolutely. So. So yeah, I guess uh, got a few more natives kind of mixed in here. But we've got the um, yellow bellwort. That's a, that's a really nice one in the spring. That's a woodland wildflower, and the best way to describe the flowers is they kind of look like bunches of bananas. If you've never seen it, <laughs> they're they're just gorgeous. And this really good sight. Yes, yeah, see those yellow they're so they're cheery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. And then this is kind of a mixed bag in here. We've got some natives, and obviously hostas are not native, but they are really hardy, so we like them sometimes. <laughs> uh, but then I can I can kind of show you. Um, this is the great blue lobelia. And this is a really funny one because we've planted it not here at all. We planted it along the driveway thinking it would like the runoff from the rain. And it died there, but it's seeded all through here. So it, it's it's a plant that will find its favorite spot if you let it. So you just have to be careful when you're weeding in the spring, and you'll find brand new brand new friends. 
or you didn't know nice. they were. Uh, this is the poke milkweed. So this is a milkweed for shade. Uh, really? So this gets like uh, morning sun right here, but then it's mostly shaded in the afternoon. It's kind of going to seed right now. And the flowers are kind of nice. They're white, greenish white. But the, the monarchs really seem attracted to it. Uh, they find it and you can see the little holes, all the little beetles and caterpillars find it too. It's polk as in P-O-L-K? P-O, P-O-K-E. Oh, poke, like a poke. poke. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the mask. The mask is interfering. <laughs> it's sleepy. It's exaltated. Yeah, there we go. And and Ben is here. Hello, Ben. <laughs> this is Ben French. If Hello. you have not met him at Johnson's or run into him there, he's uh, one of the he's the main man responsible for the native plants we buy. So thank you so much for oh, doing what you do. No problem. Appreciate it. <laughs> My pleasure. It's actually perfect timing because uh, the woodland garden is is Ben's garden, really. So. I mean, we help each other all over the place, but the woodland garden is like his baby, so. <laughs> and he grew these for us. These are um, pawpaws. Hmm. We got two pawpaws, one here and one there, and uh, some restarted strawberries in between. But <laughs> the pawpaws, the, it's a, not really native to Wisconsin, I guess, but it's a. It's a U.S. native. It's a, it's it a North American <laughs> fruit that not a lot of people know about, so. It's the largest fruit in North America. That's what it does. Oh, interesting. Fun fact. It's a very So is very that, I know plant. I've seen it around, more like Arkansas, south. Yeah. Southeast. Like, yeah, I think the northern Missouri. edge of its, its range would be in like southern Illinois. Okay. But, That's uh, what it was. But it is hardy yeah. up here, too. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, we got, uh, let's see. Oh, the red bane berry is looking beautiful right <laughs> now. <laughs> that is really great. It's really looking strong. Yeah. Oh, urban garden. <laughs> but yeah, this is a. Uh, oh, I, I can't. I can't not talk about the carpinus, the muscle wood here. This this tree just is got to be one of my favorites. <laughs> not just because. Ben works at Johnson's, which is known for Carpinus, but uh, yeah, just yeah. everything like the texture of the leaves, the seeds now that it's getting. Um, I don't know if you can get a look at the bark, but the trunk, the trunk on this guy is just starting to show a lot of good texture. Yeah, it's it a just, pretty good view over here. Yeah, right? and yeah. It, it only gets it better. Yeah, I have one that's still kind of small, hasn't gone to seed yet, but it's beautiful. Oh, yeah, even when they're little. Yeah, they're really it's nice. a really nice tree. Yeah, this is probably only like, probably eight years old. Oh, we've been here for seven, so. Yeah. And there's like a one-year-old plant. Oh, yeah, yeah, so it was like about a, little, eight. a little stick of a thing <laughs> when, we, when we planted it. Oh, we should, we should go down the garden path. This oh, okay. The, here, let's sorry, move. Lisa. That's okay? Okay. <laughs> I'm getting lost in the yard. <laughs> this is a, a really nice bed that Ben helped design. Um, we've got uh, some native sedge here. Which sedge is this, Ben? That is uh, ivory sedge. Ivory sedge. Carex invernia. Um, then we've got the uh, lady in red uh, lady fern. Tell them how ivory sedge likes dry shade. Oh, the ivory, se the, yeah, the ivory sedge is, is really good for dry shade, which is mostly what's going on over here. Uh, we've got a native plum here that we keep hoping will make plums for us because they're very small fruits, but they are very tasty. <clears throat> and it blooms and it's beautiful in the spring, but we haven't gotten fruit yet, so we're not sure if uh, she needs a friend or <laughs> or what's going on. <laughs> but uh, these right here, we got these Mondo green dragons. They are just... So green dragons are related to Jack in the Pulpit, if you're familiar with that one. That's more of a common one to find. Wow, I've never seen that. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it, it likes, um, kind of like a wet woodland. If you're, if you're ever in a place like that, you can look. And I don't see, the berries are still forming, but the flower oh, is... You can see, like, just like you said, a Jack in the Pulpit. Would this be the flower? Uh, yeah, that's like the yep. seed pod? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so it's making the seeds now. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. And it's more of the bellwort here, too. 
And we've got the, the meadow rue here. This is nice for some height in the woodland garden and the texture. I just I just love the foliage on this plant. It's really nice. I'll hook you up. <laughs> and uh, I guess we could also highlight a new a new pest that some of you might have recognized. <laughs> We've got the well this was a viburnum triloba here. Oh, trilobum. Trilobum. But uh, you can see the viburnum leaf beetle has had its way with it. Or rather its young have. And the Will it survive the attack on it? You know, come back next year or does it I'd say long term these plants are gonna have a hard time surviving. Mm. Here's the beetle right here. I don't know if you can zoom that closely or not. But that's the uh, adult stage of the beetle. Both the larva and the adult feed on the stems. And you can even see once they finish eating all the good parts of the leaf, they'll even start eating the stem. And they lay their eggs in the very tips. So even when this plant comes back next year, this is going to be a, oh, a primary feeding Oh, the eggs source. will lay on the plant through the winter? Yep. So, oh, that's... You know, Wow. Three or four years ago, this was a beautiful specimen, really good fall color, um, mm -hmm. but uh, it's pretty much been defoliated twice now this uh, year, and I don't think any plant can survive that long. Oh, uh, yeah? Yeah, it hasn't had leaves huh. since, uh, I have three, since they three came large <laughs> arrowwoods that have been defoliated two years in a row, and oh. yeah. it's hard and like, for me to pull them out, but... Uh, <laughs> and they're tough plants, and they yeah. might survive, mm -hmm. like, you know, if I cut uh -huh. this down to the ground, it would probably re-suck it but it's just not going to be a big, beautiful landscape plant anymore. It's going to be like the small, persisting thing in the, in the landscape. Mm -hmm. So living but not flourishing, basically. Right. Kind of like the way American elms are now. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you can still find American elms, but we don't have the big, beautiful specimens. Actually, I have one in my yard that volunteered and hasn't oh. been hit with any disease yet. It's huge, Yeah, and usually they and get about, beautiful. like, this big, yeah. or sometimes this big, and then one year they get Mine's about big. this big, and... Oh, yeah. that's so cool. It is, and I had an arborist come and evaluate my, my land to just because I had a lot of ash and you know everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had two come out. They both said, you know, it's healthy, it's providing good shade, it's a beautiful plant, and it's not been attacked yet because uh -huh. they come from the, as you probably know, the canopy down. Yep, tips on down. They said, nope, don't cut it. It'll be okay. So I'm not because it oh, is beautiful. Yeah. yeah, it's a sweet tree. Yeah, and hopefully in time we'll kind of see like the same resistance story mm -hmm, with like mm -hmm. viburnum trilobum and the airwoods, but it's probably going to be like, you know, 20 to 50 years before we start seeing the, the pests settle down and then resistance starting to rise in the species. Yeah, it's really too bad too because, you know, viburnums are so important yeah. in the landscape because shrubs are, you know, anchor plants, but also just for wildlife and... Anchor plants. It's an anchor plant. Is that true? discussed? No. What's an anchor plant? It just, you know, anchors the <laughs> landscape, anchors the design. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Focal point kind of Focal thing. Focal point, like yeah. foundation planting, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and birds and that, you know, it's a, one of those plants that a lot of, <laughs> a lot of wildlife enjoys, so. Mm -hmm. I'm just a simple propagator, not a landscape, <laughs> landscape designer. This is amazing. Those flowers are beautiful. Yeah, I think, um, that's that. Actually, a native plant, but it's related to the thimbleberry. Oh, it's not an actual thimbleberry. Oh, or yeah, salmonberry? Maybe it's salmonberry. Yeah, it's it's one of the two that's not from here, but. <laughs> okay. Um, but well, it mine doesn't, doesn't ever bloom, so I thought. Yeah, this oh. is this is the native here. So this oh. is actually <laughs> the thimbleberry. <laughs> Lisa, oh. <laughs> I'm okay. That's all right. I'll get over it. But no, it, ours oh. doesn't bloom either. That's the problem that we've been having as well. Uh. And you can tell it's happy. You know, it's going crazy, but it just doesn't want to bloom. And Ben's theory, and I think it makes sense, is that it just doesn't, the, the first year stems, which is basically all of these, don't make it through the winter because they're either just like not covered with snow enough, or they're just, I mean, I guess it's like a understory woodland species, so maybe it's just not sheltered enough here. Just to expose. Yeah, yep. even though, I mean, we're, we're getting our woodland. It's coming along, but I guess it's this not. Is impressive. <laughs> it is. 
So there's definitely work in progress back here, so you may have to avert your eyes at some point, but <laughs> I thought that this path right here would be a nice little view. This is where the good stuff ends. Yeah, this, this is the oldest part of the woodland. And this this damage here is caused by Japanese beetles, which is... Uh, right here. Yeah, which is, yep, Lisa found one. Yeah. So those. that's too bad. It's not defoliating the plant to the point of where it's going to have any long-term issues, you but it definitely makes it ugly. You can tell they're there. <laughs> yeah, they're like getting up on the leaves. Yeah. Do you want to talk about this? So, um, what was it called? Kegel gardening or something? Uh, he Hegel culture. Hegel culture? So that is an old German term for piling a bunch of wood in a spot and burying the wood with soil and sod and other things like that, compost. And that kind of recreates like the woodland duff type of scenario. So we did that in like a pile right here and a pile right here. And on top of those, we planted some native woodland species, <clears throat> like a white pine we have here. Um, this is a bladder nut, which is Staphylia trifoliata, and a striped maple, which is right here. And we have another striped maple right here. Hmm. We won't look at the tulip tree. Yeah, so the... the <laughs> is that it? Is no, this a tulip tree? No, this is a striped maple. Oh. So it's called striped maple because it's got the stripey oh. bark. The other name for it is snake bark maple. Or moose wood. Or moose wood, because moose like to eat it. Is that a native? Yep, this is a native plant. That is mm. interesting. It's, it's definitely not easy to find. It's not found in Never a lot seen of it. places. But yeah, here's like another one right here. And this one's actually gone to seed, which is kind of cool. Yeah, that one's... That one must have a better pocket of soil because it's not as chlorotic and hungry looking. Wow, yeah. It's just crazy. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, oh, they're, it's smooth. Yeah, they're pretty sensitive to alkaline soils. So this wow. one's got like just a little too much alkaline soil, so it's going a little bit yellow on the yep. fringes. Yeah. Whereas this one seems to have found like a, a good pocket where it's able to stay a little healthier. Wow. Yeah, don't go any further. <laughs> yeah. So down here we have a leather wood which is a kind of cool, interesting native shrub. So it's called leatherwood because it has really flexible stems that you can like almost tie into knots. Um, but it's a kind of an uncommon understory shrub. In the, in the spring it gets lots of little light yellow flowers. Yeah, and the flowers very, are fairly attractive. Very dainty. And then in the understory here we have quite a few perennials we've planted. Um, you can see some woodland ephemerals like bloodroot. It's got this very unique shaped leaf. It's called bloodroot because it's got like a, a rhizome that bleeds red. You hmm. picked it. I had to show it for the, for the show. <laughs> It'll be okay. And this is a, a ginger, mm -hmm. which is a sarum canadense. It's got this kind of like, it's fuzzy and shiny. It's a paradoxical leaf. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> And it kind of uh, creeps around the understory, making this nice mass of green. Great ground cover, for yep, sure. Really good ground mm -hmm. cover. Yep. And then we have a couple different types of Solomon seal here. This is um, false Solomon seal, which has uh, these big kind of papery, almost like cardboard leaves. And it has these big arcing stems that had little spikes of white flowers on them a couple of months ago. Berries almost look gold. Yeah, and the, <laughs> as they ripen, they kind of get redder and redder, but they keep that spotty, kind of sparkly look. Kind of spreads around. Doesn't really take over, but it always just kind of arcs around. This one is called Starry False Solomon Seal. So it's got, it's in the same family, um, but it's got stripes on the berries, and it's much more like a colony forming, I guess is a good term. Like it makes a big solid patch of itself. Good ground cover again. Yep. See, it's like fighting the creeping Charlie in here. <laughs> Another, yeah. In the shade garden, we have the creeping Charlie. In the prairie, we have the bindweed. I like to think eventually <laughs> that the, the salmon seal will win. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you keep picking the, the yeah. other yep, stuff. I think in this bed, it pretty much mm -hmm. has, actually. It's uh, a little too bad that these are done flowering now, but we had a bunch of columbine in here. Um, we have baneberry kind of popping up in here. In a couple weeks, these will start turning white. Oh, this is the, the, the doll's eye, eye. Oh, the nice. doll's eye, the white baneberry. Nice. Yeah, I planted that this year. Yeah. 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 Yep, a maiden hair fern there. back there. Yeah, I love that plant. Too. Oh, it's one of my pretty, favorites. Pretty rich understory. 
And let's see what else do we got back here. Well, I can show them the work in progress. This is like a, this is like if this bed had its skin taken off. This is what you're gonna see. So this, this right here is what this started like. So it was about that high too. Wasn't yep. It? Yep. So we'll take a pile of wood like this. So this is like lilacs and brush and just trimmings from around the yard, and we'll cover it with like a little bit of sod and dirt, or whatever else we have around, and eventually it's gonna turn into like this pile of beautiful organic matter and that's like great stuff to plant a lot of these woodland ephemerals and native mm. trees on mm. because it's a lot like woodland soil that way yep. yeah yeah because otherwise the soil that this yard came with was really not the best um i mean it was all just lawn for probably decades so not much love was given mm -hmm. to it so this really gave uh, like you can see how green the white pine is, and we've got neighbors that have white pines that are kind of yellowing. Like that one there. So we've got, um, <laughs> it just gives them a really good start, and um, you know, I'm sure this was woodland at one time in its past, so it's kind of cool to be able to kind of restore that and just really help out the soil and the, you know, the whole ecosystem in our backyard. Yeah. Is well, this oak here? Yep, that, that's a chinkapin oak. Oh, I felt bad I forgot about it. How could you forget? I didn't know. So that's a chinkapin I grew from an acorn my first year as an intern. <laughs> so it's only like maybe about ten, years yeah, old? about 10 or 9 years old. 9 years old probably. And when we first planted it, it was about yay high. And it grew about 2 feet its first year. But uh, during a storm, it cracked off, and see like this little scar right here? Mm -hmm. It actually broke off completely and grew from that oh, to almost goodness. the top of the, wow. like that, that straight run there. It was yeah. almost probably eight feet in one year. Wow. And then it's just been branching ever since. Very cool. It was kind of silly looking, but. And what, what's the oak <laughs> in the back corner there? Is that another chink up there? Uh, that's a no. swamp white and burr hybrid oak. So that's Quercus ex shuidae, for any oak nerds out there. <laughs> there are a few. Yep. And then uh, you can see just to the left of that, an ironwood that we've got mm. growing there. And then left of that, a sugar maple. And all of those are planted, I think, just about the same time. Yeah, they all looked like Similar sticks. size. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when mm -hmm. we first got here, about this big. I, I felt like I had to explain to the neighbors, we didn't plant sticks, they are actually trees. <laughs> 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 they didn't have leaves either, it was March, so. And it's, and it's kind of cool, because like, we're actually starting to get like canopy. You know, the trees are almost mm -hmm. touching. And eventually, this is all going to be completely shaded. Yeah. Another cool tree, if you can like see this way. Yeah. And if the hammerman can see it this way. <laughs> Oh, before I talk about the trees, this is the, the Solomon seal, true to its name, not one of those false make-believe ones. So it's got these really clean green leaves, and you can really tell, like, what sun exposure and what shade can do to a plant. Remember how, like, the crispy leaves on the starry Solomon seal are on that side? But look how clean and green they are on this side. Mm. So, like, just a little too much sun can really bleach them out. Um, but yeah, they've got, like, these drooping berries, and these will turn, like, a, a midnight blue. They're really, really kind of cool. You can't eat them or anything. They're toxic, but they are valuable to wildlife. Very ornamental. Something must eat them because I never get to the point of the dark blue berries. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think birds do do go for them. But uh, that large tree there is the oh. tamarack, mm -hmm. and from the from our upstairs window, you can see the sugar maple and the tamarack are having a race for fastest growing tree in our yard. They're like neck and neck right now. Sugar maple has a little edge. I think probably, especially long term. And did you guys talk about anemone yet in the, in the prairie? We talked about the, the thimble flower in the prairie. Yeah, so the thimble flower is found out in our prairie, and it's also found back here. And I didn't plant this, so it just like seeded. But it's kind of neat seeing like the plant out there and the plant here and like how different they are. Yeah. Even though they're the, the same species. I was surprised to see them out front, finding actually, a spot to live here. I have them in my yard, um, the woodlands part yeah. of it. Yeah. But where we Versatile. actually pick the seeds, they're on like a rock escarpment. So it's like almost like a goat prairie. Mm -hmm. um, so they do like high and dry too. Now the tamarack, does it lose its needles in the winter? Yep, that's the fun fact about tamarack. It, uh, all the needles turn like a really nice golden color and fall off. So then you have a bare tree for winter. When they come out in the spring, it's just the happiest looking plant. They're just little, little green 
little tufts. Like, like a koosh ball. If anyone, if anyone remembers what a koosh ball is. <laughs> That's what they always remind you of. Probably your elderberry. And, and elderberry, yep. everyone loves elderberry, mm. don't they? Or hope they hate it, some people. But, uh, and actually, uh, one year, a couple of years ago, picked a bunch of the flowers and soaked them in vodka, and it tasted delicious. Elderberry wine? <laughs> there is that song by Elton John. Oh, yeah. Elderberry wine? <laughs> yeah. And uh, one of these years, I'm going to beat the birds and actually pick some berries and make syrup, but that just never seems to happen because <laughs> I think the day they ripen, they are just gone. <laughs> so, great wildlife plant, though. Really. <laughs> Well, this is certainly a most beautiful yard. We're yeah. getting close to an hour, so is there anything else that either of you would like to point out, showcase? Maybe your tiny village? Is that where you oh, put your guests? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you need to stay the night, you know, <laughs> we have a socially distanced bedroom <laughs> out here. <laughs> You'd have your Tropical. own space. <laughs> That was like the only thing in the yard when we bought yeah, the house, <laughs> besides lawn. And, it came wow. with, it came with the place. <laughs> and the raspberries, they were here too. Yes, the raspberries. Yeah. You know, another thing I noticed, the wild strawberry down here. And oh. what a great ground cover it is, plus oh. a food for... That, that barren strawberry. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, a tri it's a tricky plant though, because it's, it's the, non, the not edible yeah so if you zoom in way down close this is in the the same family as strawberry but if you look closely the Ooh, seeds different. are like red if you had a native strawberry an edible type the seeds would be tan hmm. well, I so have to this, look at the ones in my yard I didn't know yeah so this a is a non-edible I think it's non-edible and the flowers are yellow yeah I don't know if the I yeah can't like remember here's it. a here's a flower actually yeah it's a little different. So there's the flower, which is yellow. A native strawberry would be white. I think I have the native then. Yay. Yeah, Yeah. that's good for you. That's a, that's yeah. one that I'd like to get, actually. But look at how this, I just kind of rolled it, and it all the so seeds much roll water, up. Yeah. though. It's, I mean. It's definitely not like a strawberry, if you like no, look at it. No, uh, 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 uh. Which is too bad, because they look tasty, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> they trick me all the time. Well, do animals still eat these? I mean, I guess they must. Yeah, not poisonous. I my guess is robins probably do because they go after my strawberries like crazy. So maybe <laughs> yeah, it's like the same kind of plant, you know. Right, right. A little yeah. distribution. Yeah. And they kind of just volunteered in here. Like, I don't remember seeing them on the place, but now they do. Yeah, <laughs> I, in my yard too. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. amazing what comes up when you start oh. clearing invasive plants and yeah. you know, maybe just some like room stop and... spraying two four deer. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Well, you certainly have got a lot of things going on here in this yard, I mean. Yeah, probably a little too much for, for what's healthy. I don't think so. How can you ever have too many native plants then, you know that? It's just a lot of work. Yeah, it <laughs> for, is. For it us is. plant people. Yeah, it is. Well, All right, um, well, thanks for joining us here today. Yeah, thank you both for sharing your yard. Really appreciate it. Everybody stay tuned. We'll be posting this move, this uh, video on YouTube, and we'll also be working on a video for August. So take care.